Listen, we need to talk. This whole One United Empire business isn't really working out. I'm more financially responsible. I don't attract trouble. I'm more sophisticated. I love Jesus more. Oh, and lastly, I'm well insured. So honestly, it feels like I'm better off without you. But let's be friends, eh? <laughs> okay, maybe the Roman Empire split didn't play out as a cringy melodrama, but this division did in fact throw two once united and interconnected parts of the world on two separate trajectories. But what if I told you that it was actually better for the empire to divide, in that breaking apart the Roman world actually gave the empire the momentum it needed to face the ever-changing realities from within and without. And more importantly for you, viewer, you probably experienced the effects of this rupture in your daily life, whether you know it or not. Now, there are many possible reasons why Rome split apart, but in this video, I will outline three of the main arguments given by scholars. Most historians date Rome's division to the year 395, after the death of Theodosius the Great, the last emperor to rule a united empire. Following his death, the western and eastern halves were ruled by his two sons, Honorius and Arcadius, respectively. Historians refer to the western half as the Western Roman Empire and the eastern half the Eastern Roman Empire, also known as the Byzantine Empire. Never again would both halves be governed by a single administration following 395 AD. Before continuing, let's get one thing clear. The split between east and west had already been in effect, informally, however. Rome has had a history of being politically and administratively divided since the time of the Republic. Here is an inexhaustive list of Roman rulers and emperors who saw fit to split the empire with a colleague, a sibling, or a son. Take a second to take it in. The reason for this collegiate system of emperors was simply that the Roman world was much too big to be led by one single person. The empire at its height stretched from the British Isles to the Tigris and Euphrates rivers in modern day Iraq. Therefore, its vast borders needed constant attention, especially in the western half, since this frontier had to manage numerous Germanic tribes that grew more and more intrusive as time went on. Likewise, quick and constant communications were vital to the integrity of the empire, as with any polity. And of course, things were a bit slower back then, uh, compared to our modern world. In a single day, a messenger could only travel 20 miles by foot, up to 100 by horse, and over 100 by sea if the weather was favorable. If an invasion, civil unrest, or any calamity unfolded in a particular province, the central administration would have some difficulty responding quickly and effectively. Thus, the empire needed multiple centralized zones to mitigate the growing crises. In the year 293, Diocletian addressed this issue by creating a tetrarchy, or a rule of four emperors residing in four major cities within strategic military, administrative, and economic zones of the empire. Again, the empire's vastness made controlling the borders quite a Herculean feat. The military resources and strategies needed to defend the western territories differed from those required to protect the eastern regions. By 395 AD, the empire's military priorities and capabilities had diverged, leading to separate military commands and strategies for the western and eastern halves. The east dealt with its neighboring superpower of Sasanian Persia, while the west didn't have the luxury of negotiating with one major threat, but dozens of them. The western Roman Empire was particularly vulnerable to barbarian invasions from Germanic tribes, such as the Visigoths, Vandals, Alamanni, Burgundians, Swabi, Alans, Angles, Saxons, Franks, and most notoriously, the Huns. Because the East shared a short border with these tribes, it made the defense of their core regions an easier task, and consequently, funneling all of these threats to the more vulnerable West. The military challenges posed by these invasions strained the empire's resources and contributed to the fragmentation of the Western territories. Rome was simply a victim of its own success. A good part of the West's troubles was also due to prioritization. Several reform-minded emperors took a particular liking to the East. Diocletian took a residence in Nicomedia and later retired to Salona on the Adriatic coast. 
Constantine, of course, founded New Rome on the Bosphorus, which the locals called Constantinople, siphoning the empire's resources and elites from Rome in the west to the New Rome of the east. Both emperors barely set foot in Rome. And then there's the rivalry between leading figures in both spheres exacerbating the division. For instance, right after Theodosius' death in 395, the Magister Militum, Stilicho, believed that the late emperor gave him guardianship over the two heirs of the east and west. However, Rufinus, the Praetorian prefect of the east, as well as his colleagues in the eastern court, aggressively opposed Stilicho's overreach, relegating him to the guardianship over the western heir Honorius, and not both sovereigns, only one. Until his death, Stilicho vied for control of both halves, putting each region on the brink of civil war. This episode is only one example of the breakdown of political relations between the Roman East and West. Okay, now let's quickly tackle the next few reasons why the Roman Empire split. There had already been a cultural divide between both spheres of the empire since before its formation. Again, hearkening back to the Republican era when Rome incorporated the Hellenistic kingdoms of the East. And in this conquest, although Greek culture, philosophy, and religion permeated throughout the Roman world, it still held strong roots in the East. Over time, the Western and Eastern parts of the Roman Empire developed distinct cultural identities influenced by various factors, including language, religion, and tradition. The Eastern Roman Empire, centered around Constantinople, became more influenced by Greek culture, with the Christianity within this region being articulated in Greek, the original language of Christian scripture, while the Western Roman Empire retained its Latin roots, even more so after St. Jerome completed his Latin translation of the Bible, the Vulgate, in 405. There was a certain cultural difference between the Latin West and the Greek East, uh, which could provide a theory to how both spheres were Christianized. Latin Christianity was more exact, terse, and doctrinal. Greek Christianity was more fluid, flexible, interpretive, mystical, and could use more words to convey deeper meanings. This is evident in the writings of Tertullian, Jerome, Ambrose, and Augustine versus the writings of Origen, Clement, and the Cappadocian Fathers. Christianity in each sphere eventually took on their own identities, the East becoming Eastern Orthodox and the West Roman Catholic. However, again, I must reiterate that this was not a hard split and did not happen overnight. Ecclesiastical unity between both worlds persisted until the East-West Schism, also known as the Great Schism, in 1054 AD, which formalized the split between the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church. Lastly, let's talk money. As with the previous reasons, the economic divide between both halves stems from the Roman Republic's conquest of the lucrative, densely populated metropolises of the Eastern Mediterranean, while the West really didn't have as many major cities. Furthermore, the urban centers in Anatolia, Egypt, and the Levant predate the Greco-Roman world. Thus, a long history of sophisticated urban planning, advanced crop production, lucrative trade routes, and large tax bases had been the bedrock of this region before Rome's conquest. So in essence, the East already had a leg up on the West. And although Italy and much of southern Gaul, Hispania, and Africa urbanized as the centuries went by, the West still functioned primarily as a rural economy and could not compete with the East regarding trade, resources, or population for taxation purposes. But as time went on, the Roman Empire's economic challenges, including inflation, taxation issues, trade disruptions, and the loss of revenue from conquered territories affected both the western and eastern regions. These fiscal woes were blatantly on display during the crisis of the third century. However, the economic pressures were often felt more acutely in the west, where declining resources and economic instability contributed to its eventual downfall. Likewise, low pay impacted recruitment numbers and infrastructure upkeep for the western provinces. The Eastern Roman Empire, with its strategic location at the crossroads of Europe, Africa, and Asia, remained a center of trade and commerce, contributing to its economic resilience compared to the Western regions, which faced greater economic challenges. Therefore, the concentration of wealth lay in the East, and a strong economy brings greater stability. So, in reality, the Roman world had always been divided. 
however, less obvious until we get to the late empire. And even then, both halves cooperated at times against common foes. For instance, the West and the East combined their navies to try at taking back Africa from the Vandals in 431. And even though the operation was a disaster for the Romans, it did show that both sides could militarily coordinate and amass vast amounts of resources for joint operations. But finally, when the western half fell to usurpers and barbarians, the east remained politically intact for another millennium. And although the traditional Roman state apparatus disappeared in the west, Latin Christianity still survived and even flourished, becoming the institutional bedrock and unifying power within medieval western Europe. So why is the 395 date important? Well, it's more of a benchmark for historians. It's hindsight allowing us to compartmentalize and periodize sections of history. Because it's not if a Roman farmer living in Sicily in 395 woke up one day and said, oh my gosh, I'm living in the Western Roman Empire now. So in the end, the division between East and West in 395 was, although a lopsided outcome in favor of the East, nevertheless injected vitality to both halves of the empire, giving the West nearly a hundred more years of life and the East a thousand more. But did Rome really fall? An argument can be made that the empire actually continued into modernity. Check out this video to see how. Like, share, comment, subscribe. See you next time.